Poor Things, the new film from Yorgos Lanthimos, is expanding theaters this weekend. Poor Things is both the name of this film and what I call the clueless people who have to announce all the awards this year and try to navigate the name Yorgos Lanthimos. This video is brought to you by Factor. Go to factormeals.com slash Merle50 to get half off your Factor order and stay tuned after this review for more info. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle here with my review of Poor Things, which is sort of in the middle of its release schedule right now. It opened in a very small number of theaters last weekend. It's expanding to a few more this weekend, and then it will be in a lot more theaters next weekend, so it seems like a good time to review the movie. As mentioned, this is the latest film from Yorgos Lanthimos, who's made some great movies that I love, including The Lobster, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, and The Favorite. The screenplay adaptation is from writer Tony McNamara, who also wrote The Favorite and created created the TV series The Great. Poor Things is about a character named Bella, played by Emma Stone, a young woman who's the product of experimentation by her creator, Dr. Baxter, a Frankenstein-like figure played by Willem Dafoe. Bella has the body of a woman but the mind of a child and is only beginning to learn about the world around her. Understand, me never lived outside God's house. What? So Bella's so much to discover, and your sad face makes me discover angry feelings for you. Poor Things is largely the story of Bella's journey of discovery and self-discovery as she learns about the world's truths, beautiful, ugly, harsh, and joyous as they may be. Rami Youssef plays a protege of Dr. Baxter's whose job it is to study Bella at first, but soon finds himself drawn to her. And Mark Ruffalo is absolutely delightful in this movie as Duncan Wedderburn, a lawyer who attempts to whisk Bella away, unaware that he's now part of her attempt to know everything there is to know about the world world. You're always reading now, Bella. You're losing some of your adorable way of speaking. Poor Things has been the subject of a lot of awards buzz and has gotten a lot of the critical nominations and awards nominations so far, and I think that it's very well deserved. A lot of it has to do with Yorgos Lanthimos, who is able to do something that's really kind of special. It's something that I've never really seen a director be able to do before. He is able to be both completely detached from humanity, but also intimately connected to characters and human emotion. It's like he's able to tell very relatable stories about very complex complex interpersonal relationships, but at a distance. It's a very, very unique perspective that he brings to his films, and it's unlike any other perspective from any other director floating around out there right now. He really is one of my favorite directors. He is a master of tone and performance, able to weave farce, satire, and broad comedy with drama and pathos. A massive amount of credit for this film also has to go to Robbie Ryan, the movie's director of photography, who mixes the familiar fisheye look that we associate with Yorgos Lanthimos' work with a mixture of black and white and color throughout the film that reflects Bella's view of the world. The production design from Shona Heath and James Price is also impressive, with much of the movie's look and scenery done practically in camera. It looks both surreal and real at the same time, which is the perfect feel for this movie. And the score from first-time composer Composer Jeskin Fendrix is unlike anything that I've heard before. It's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, much like this movie, but I really, really dug it. Overall, it's the perfect combination of script, performance, production, post-production to hit the exact note that this movie is going for. And it's not a note that everybody's gonna be attuned to. That's what I've talked about so much about movies and art. They're all kind of like their own little symphonies and they're playing their own type of music and not everybody is gonna have an ear for that particular type of music and that's okay. But if you are on this movie's frequency, then I think that you're really, really gonna like it. I was on this movie's frequency. The performances are stellar all around, but really the spotlight has to go to Emma Stone. She has so much ground to cover in this movie, from broad comedy to moments of intense introspection, trauma, joy, sexual awakening, pain. Hello, Bella. No. Oh. Oh. Bud. Oh. Blood. Bud. Blood. It's all done perfectly, and you can tell that she has a great relationship with Yorgos Lanthimos 
artistically. She's able to pull those moments to, to go broad when she needs to go, to go smaller when she needs to go smaller. I think it's the best performance I've ever seen from her, which is saying a lot. She's an Academy Award winner, and she's been great in a lot of other movies. Willem Dafoe has to balance the grotesque with a slowly unfolding picture of who his character really is, which is deeply human. Dr. Baxter is a damaged man inside and outside, and I think that this character is a great portrait of abuse and the cycle of abuse and how somebody, even if they think it's from a place of love or from breaking the cycle, can pass down the pain and the trauma of their own past and their own upbringing onto their own children and the people around them. It's a really restrained, subdued performance from Willem Dafoe, but again, he has to do some things that are incredibly absurd. He's got the prosthetics and everything. It's, it's a monstrous type of look, but it's a very reserved performance, and he's so good in this movie. And then we've got Mark Ruffalo, who just goes all out in playing a completely despicable character, a small man with delusions of greatness who sees in Bella a conquest to be won. And as Bella's sense of self grows, Ruffalo's character becomes more and more petulant. It reminded me a lot of Olivia Coleman's character and her performance in The Favorite in the sense that this character is allowed to be just pure id. It's all just whatever instinct and emotion is bubbling to surface at the time. And Ruffalo is really just kind of given free reign to do what he wants. And he is so funny and so pathetic uh, and so, as I said, it's sometimes just despicable. And he's able to balance it all so well. This might be my favorite performance from Mark Ruffalo. And that's really saying something because he's also been great in a lot of other movies. I've been able to digest poor things over a number of days since I first saw it because of the release structure and because screeners went out for some critics for nominations and stuff. And I don't always have a lot of time to chew on movies before I do my reviews. And I was glad that I did because I was sitting down to gather my thoughts for this review and I was trying to figure out the story. It's so unique. And I keep using that word, but that really is a word that you can apply to this movie. It's so singular in many ways, and yet it also felt to me in some way familiar. And I was trying to figure that out, and then it just kind of struck me. Poor Things is about a naive character locked away from society who leaves her sheltered existence and goes out into the real world where she learns hard lessons about the place she's expected to take in a male-driven society as she seeks to upset the status quo, bumping heads with a comically immature romantic interest on a journey of self-discovery. Poor Things is basically Barbie just with a much more skewed lens. It's saying a lot of the same things. It's covering a lot of the same ground. Emma Stone is Barbie. Mark Ruffalo is Ken. And when you look at it through that lens, there are so many different parallels. You have that same outsider perspective of Bella entering an already established world and the introduction of a male-dominated society and the patriarchy and that sort of fish out of water, that fresh perspective that she's able to give where she can comment on the ridiculous and flout all of these societal standards that everybody in the quote-unquote real world takes for granted. And you have the frustration of Mark Ruffalo's character who wants to occupy this role and is being defied by Emma Stone's character and becomes more and more childish as the movie goes on. There's so much that these two movies have in common, and yet I really love this movie. It's one of my favorites this year, and I liked Barbie, certainly not as much as other people, but didn't love it. And I think it's because I agree with the themes and the messages that you take away from both movies, but this film... I think, says many of the same things in a much more interesting and creative uh, and many times subtle or not quite as overt way. That was my biggest issue with Barbie. I know that some people loved it because it was just so head on with what it was doing and what it was taking on. And I understand why that spoke to so many different people. But for me, I was able to connect to this movie more because it was more through the filter and the lens of these characters and the world and much less about the movie sort of just saying outright what it thinks and what it wants the audience to take away from the film. I'm not laying out a choice, by the way. I'm not saying you can only like Poor Things or Barbie. I think you can like both movies equally, but I think it's a very interesting interesting case study in how two films can be very similar in many ways, but speak to audiences in very different ways. Because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people who loved Barbie, 
who don't really like this movie for different reasons. And I totally get that. And that's the thing that I always say about film criticism and art, etc. There's no right opinion. There's no wrong opinion. And the whole driving force for me behind film criticism is to start discussions like this. Why did you like this movie? Why did you not like this movie? Why did I like it? Why did you like it? It's a discourse. It's not trying to find the answer to anything because there is no answer. It's art, it's subjective. It's all about these kinds of discussions. And this one has at least internally sparked a very interesting discussion for myself, just in my own head. One significant diversion from Barbie is that Poor Things is very locked into Bella's awakened sexuality. So I have to warn you that this could win the most uncomfortable to watch with your parents award this holiday season, if things like that matter to you. But I mainly found Poor Things to be a rich story with interesting characters, relatable themes, and a beautifully skewed vision of our world. If I was going to knock the film, I would say that it is perhaps a bit too long, and it does languish at times on Bella's awakened sexuality to the point that I think some may find this film gratuitous, and I think that that is a conversation worth having. But otherwise, this gets a See It Now recommendation for me with the caveat that this movie's tone is very specific. If you haven't seen Yorgos Lanthimos's work before, it could be a bit of a shock to the system. It's a similar disclaimer that I gave to The Boy and the Heron and Hayami Ozaki's aesthetics. If you're not quite sure if this is going to be your thing, maybe watch one of Yorgos Lanthimos's other films. But at the same time, I think the strength of the performances, the strength of the visuals, the strength of the themes could overcome any of that shock to the system with the style of the movie. So those are my thoughts on Poor Things. What do you think? Are you going to be seeing it when it is in a theater near you? Let me know down in the comments below. And before I wrap up, I want to thank the sponsor for this video, Factor. It's the holidays and odds are that you're running around trying to finish work, shop for loved ones, and get everything you need to do crossed off your list. Well, with Factor, you can get nutritious, flavorful meals to help you eat well for breakfast, lunch and dinner delivered right to your door so you don't have to worry about it. You can skip the meal planning, grocery shopping, prepping and cleaning up with Factor's fresh, never frozen meals and you won't have to clear much time in your schedule because Factor meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Each week, you can choose from over 35 chef-crafted meals that support a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences. And Factor isn't just for dinner. They also offer over 55 add-ons from quick breakfast items, lunch to go, grab-and-go snacks, and ready-to-drink cold-pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies. This December, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose what you want and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered right to your door, ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash Merle50 and use code Merle50 to get 50% off. That's code Merle50 at factormeals.com slash Merle50 to get 50% off. Thanks to Factor for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching it. I'll be back very soon with more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe and I'll see you then. Bye.